One, two, three. Hallelujah. Amen. Clap for the Lord. Amen. Praise God. Amen. What a wonderful night it is. Let's all be seated in the house of the Lord. Wonderful night. Wonderful opportunity to get in the word. The Bible is true. Amen. The Bible is true. Amen. And if as long as you decide that you're going to believe that, then you have the ability to flourish. Amen. You have the ability to go just as far as God will take you. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm going somewhere. somewhere. Okay, praise God. Um, All right, we're going to get right into this. It's uh, Wednesday night, so we're going to preach this message on faith. Let me pray. Father God, in the name of Jesus, thank you for blessing us, blessing us to be here tonight. We thank you for giving us yet another opportunity to sit at your feet and to receive fresh rhema from heaven. I bind the work of the devil right now in the name of Jesus, that there be no distractions, but that your word would go forth and accomplish that which you've sent it to. We thank you, Lord, and we surrender to the power of the Holy Ghost now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Church said amen. amen. Praise God. All right. Clap for the Lord. Amen. All right. Look at your name. Say, get your Bible out. Okay, amen. So faith so is really important. I've, I've said this often, but as soon as you get saved, you need to learn about faith because it's going to be faith that's going to keep you. Uh, there are going to be times where you, you won't feel like believing. Amen. There are going to be times where it seems like things aren't going your way and what you started out believing, you'll, have, you'll be tempted to change that belief. But if you establish your faith and you understand that God doesn't change, then you'll be able to persevere through any situation. Uh, I want to uh, preach this message tonight entitled Taking Your Power Back. Taking Your Power Back. And so when we look at power, we think about the empowerment that comes from God. We're filled with the Holy Spirit. And so we're empowered to win. How many of you, how many of you believe that if you got God on your side, you can prevail? I mean, you have a better chance than anyone else because you have God. And if you believe that, then you start to feel empowered. And so when I say taking your power back, the greatest power of a Christian is the power to believe. The greatest power of a Christian is the power to believe. Think about what Christianity is. How many of you have seen Jesus in the physical form? No, no amens. But yet you believe him. If someone came to you right now and told you that, this whole Jesus thing was fake, what would you say? Somehow you're convinced. Well, why are you convinced? It's because you believe. That's a power that is in you, and that power is not subject to circumstances or anything like that. How many of y'all have gone through some rough times, but you still believe God? And you you knew God's going to get you through it, amen? And and maybe the enemy or maybe even some friends or, or family may say, you know, I don't know, man, you keep going to that church, you keep doing that Christian thing, it doesn't seem like stuff is working out for you, but yet you still believed. Well, because that's a power that you've been given. And so the greatest power of a Christian is to is the power to believe when one truly believes they become an unstoppable force. Now, I want to make sure you guys understand this, because a lot of things in the Bible. You will see them in the world but they just don't give God credit for it. And so you will hear people start talking positive and the power of positive thinking, and they'll do all this type of stuff, but they don't give God credit for it. But it's all biblically based, and it works for Christians and non-Christians. And so we want to be able to understand that it's a tremendous advantage for us because we've done what's required. We've given our lives to the Lord. Well, why would we be shortchanged and miss out on all these benefits that are, uh, you know, expressed to us or um, made clear to us through the Bible. And so once again, this power is not reserved for just Christians. This power is available to all human beings. And the reason is, is we're created in the image of God. Did you guys know that? Do you know that even if you have a family member or a friend or somebody like that who is an atheist, they're still created in the image of God. Amen. There's nothing you can do about that. Amen. Uh, they're, maybe they're uh, a Muslim or whatever. They're still created in the image of God. Right. And so when we start to understand the God-given potential deposited in mankind, 
Boy, there's a God given potential deposited in mankind. This thing is astounding. You would be amazed if you ever start to pay attention to the potential that's on the inside of you. And we have people that are succeeding and people are failing. But a lot of that is right there at the core of what they believe. And so let's go to Genesis, Genesis chapter one, Genesis chapter one, verse 26. And God said, let us make man in our image. And so we believe in the Trinity, the father, the son. What else? Okay, so that's the Trinity. God expresses himself in three persons. We believe in that because it's biblical. But he says, and God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over the cattle and over the, all the earth and over everything that creeps upon the earth. And so we learn from this scripture that we're created in the image and likeness of God. And so what this means is that we are endued with the nature and character of God. Do you believe that about yourself? that you have the nature and character of God on the inside. But what does man spend all of his time trying to do? Find himself, searching for something, searching for power. You have people, uh, man, sus- subscribing to all kind of weird stuff. They'll do anything to try to, you know, reach another level of power. I remember years ago, that was some information it it was this was a long time ago i mean when you you know back when they had the vhs tapes and all that type stuff but there was some people that were like trying to have this higher level of enlightenment and they're going to this place and getting a hole cut in their head i'm like what you're getting a, a hole cut in your head to get a greater level of enlightenment well the enemy will deceive people but when we understand that i have power in me because i'm created in the image of god Well, the enemy doesn't want you to believe that. He doesn't want you to believe. And what was the problem that Jesus faced? All the Pharisees, they all said, blasphemy. You're saying that you are the son of God. And that just shook up everything because the devil's behind that. He doesn't want you to believe that you truly are created in in the image of God. Because what will happen is if you believe that, you'll start acting like that. And if you ever start acting like that, the way you're created to act, then now you start experiencing victory that the devil can't do anything about. Amen. And so we are endued with the nature, the nature and character of God. Now, the awesome thing about this is no other creature. Amen. Got all these. Everybody, everybody got rights for everything right these days. Rights for animals, rights for this. That's fine. Be nice to animals, but they're not created in the image of God. Amen. Amen. So don't don't get too deep with this thing. You know, me and my dog pray together. Pray to what? (laughs) The dog don't know how to pray. He can't communicate with God like you can. We're the only ones that are created in the image of God. And so no other creature, no other creature created on planet Earth or anywhere else is created in the, in the image of God. That's why you can't go worshiping angels. People get themselves in trouble doing that. Worshiping angels. Angels are not created in the image of God. The only ones that are created in the image of God is us. And so we understand this. Go to Psalm 82.6. A lot of people, this would be considered a controversial scripture, but Jesus quoted it. And so it's in the Bible. This is Psalms, but Jesus quoted it in the Gospels as well. He says, have I said you are gods and all of you are children of the most high. Now, this doesn't mean you're a God unto yourself. Now, there is some some religious stuff out there where people call themselves God. Y'all ever heard of any of that? You ever heard people name themselves God? There, there's a guy, there's a dude. Uh, he's popular because he keep he'll pop up. But I, I only know about him because some people that are supposed to be pastors interviewed him or something. But what's that guy's name? Uh, something like Charlemagne the God or something. He's like the God. People put the God in their name. 
That's not what this scripture is talking about. So don't don't leave here talking about I'm going to add God to my name. No, you're created in the image of God. And if you read the scripture in the proper context, he says you are God's, but that G is little. It's not big. And so the letters mean something. You are God's and all of you are children of the most high. And so that just means we're God's offspring. Amen. And so we are God's children. If we understand that, then now we can advance in this life. And then we could walk forward and see ourselves. OK, wait, I'm creating an image of God. Hmm. And that's how many of you guys would say that? That's pretty powerful. Like if you really thought about it, you said. You just looked in the mirror and said, I'm creating the image of God. And if you convince yourself to believe it, you might feel powerful. You might feel strong. Because what if you start to think, well, if depression can't take out God, come on. It can't take out me. Amen. Well, then you want to associate with God in such a way that it starts to influence your perception of yourself. And so we are actually created to act like God in the earth. So what does it mean to act like God? I mean, think about it. Sometimes people don't even think about that. They don't want the pressure of that. To act like God. Because religion is man's attempt to get to God. But Christianity is man experiencing a relationship with God. And so now from my relationship is going to flow certain things. And so it's not about me trying to get somewhere. It's about me experiencing this God on a personal level and then starting to be transformed based upon what I'm experiencing with my God. Amen. Amen. But religion is you got to do this. You got to wear that. You got to do all these things to try to get to where. Get to your God. But if you learn that, wait, I'm created in his image. And when I receive Jesus, he's in me. So I don't have to go anywhere to get to him. I don't have to pray only on, you know, there's some churches, man, that they believe uh, everything we're doing is wrong. You're only supposed to have church on Saturday. But because, you know, they they said, well, the Sabbath and all this type of stuff. But Jesus says, I am the Lord of the Sabbath. And he made it clear to people and he made it clear to all the religious people because he purposefully did things on the Sabbath. He healed on the Sabbath. Matter of fact, he and his disciples ate on the Sabbath. He did so many things to let them know that was a shadow that was something to prepare you for what has come. Now, all of us as Christians, we're the ones that get to experience what Jesus was prepping them for. Now we get to experience this relationship. And so I say, well, OK, I'm supposed to act like God here in the earth. Now, the enemy is going to say, no, come on now, you. You can't act. Like God. And then you know what? You're going to get a lot of church people that are afraid to say that. So how you act there? Oh, hey man, I'm just acting like God. Oh, no. Any of you guys confident to say that? Just, just walking around. How you doing today? Blessed? Just acting like God in the earth. That's what's supposed to be happening. But the enemy knows that we're created this way. So the enemy knows this, but he also knows that his only way of stopping us is to attack our belief. The enemy's only way to stop you is to attack <clears throat> your belief. So now, why is this so important? Because even though the truth is the truth, that doesn't mean you have to believe it. And if you don't believe it, you don't benefit from it. Right. Amen. Now, it's true. And there will be plenty of people benefiting from it. 
But the enemy knows that God has given man a free will. And man with that free will has to choose what he's going to believe. And so um, Proverbs 23, 7, you guys know this. He says, for as he thinks in his heart, so is he. So even though God tells me I'm created in his image, even though he tells me I am created to dominate and rule and, and represent him in the earth. But if I believe something else, if I believe that I'm defeated, then what am I? More than a conqueror or defeated? Now, whose fault is that? It's not God's fault. And people say, well, you know, I'm just struggling. It seems like everything always goes wrong. Every time I'm close to getting some good or some breakthrough, then something always happens. You know why? Because you believe that. But if you change that and you say, I am created in the image of God, I'm also blessed by God. I'm also the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I'm also walking around with favor because he surrounds the righteous with favor as with a shield. Then now your expectations change. Now what happens is if you start to expect more good then what ends up showing up is more good. Oh, pastor, that sounds new age. That's because you're not reading your Bible. Don't let what God has put out here. Don't let the world cause you to miss out on it. Because a lot of people are afraid of faith. They're afraid of people that speak by faith. They're afraid of things that we do. There's people out there in our world that are afraid of these things. But if we would be those that say, this is what I'm going to believe and that settles it and nothing's going to move me from it, then now we'll start to advance. And so as he thinks in his heart, so is he. And so you can literally become what you believe. You guys believe that. You can become what you believe. Why? Now, if you ever read up on any successful people before anyone has accomplished anything or did anything great, they believe they can do it. Even when they were not getting any results, they, still, they believed it. They believed that they had the ability to do something, to do something great. Amen? Now that potential is in there. The potential's in them and placed in them by God, but the question is, are we going to believe it? Or not. Now, here's what ends up happening is a lot of people are told a bunch of stuff by a lot of other people. And sometimes they tend to believe more of what someone else has told them, and they have not yet learned what God has said about them. And so because of that, their progress is hindered. And so you could literally become what you believe. So now, I want to help you guys with this tonight. True belief has to be heart level belief. OK. True belief has to be heart level belief, because as he says, as he thinks in his heart, so is he. It's not just as he thinks in his mind. It has to be heart level belief, because if it's heart level belief, it cannot be influenced by circumstances. Come on, man. How many people, don't even raise your hand or say nothing, but I'm just saying it. There have been so many people that what they once believed has been changed. It's been changed because of what's been going on. And there were people that, but they were bold at one point, or they believed in this and they believed in that, but now they don't believe in that no more. Why? Because it was not heart-level belief. If it's heart-level belief, no matter what the circumstances are. Come on, man. If it's heart level belief, no matter what the circumstances are. Now, you've been in a situation where, man, you just been having a rough day. Come on. Or it seemed like this stuff is mounting up on you. Just stuff coming from everywhere or whatever. Well, the enemy would try to use those rough times to change what you believe. Because if you change what you believe, then now you're going to change your results. Amen? 
And so once again, true belief has to be heart, heart level belief, which cannot be influenced by circumstances. Go to Matthew, Matthew 4. Matthew 4, uh, as always, we go to a lot of scriptures, but you guys just get used to it because that's what's going to build your belief. What's going to build your belief? What does he say? Romans 10, 17. Faith comes by hearing. hearing and hearing by the word of God. Well, I've always added that fear comes by hearing and hearing by the word of man. And so the more you hear the news and all this other stuff, then the more that fear is going to mount up on you and start to get you to pull away from some of these things that you once believed. So Jesus, we know this story. Jesus is he's he's being tempted, right? The Holy Ghost, he's been led up here so he could be tempted. But let's just read into some of this. Then was Jesus led up of the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterwards hungry. So stop right there. You guys, you know, you've seen a commercial hangry, right? And it's like the Snickers. It's a, but they got an attitude, man, just mad. Uh, they, come on, some of y'all, some of y'all had attitude. You, you, you hungry? Come on, you're a little, little edgy, a little snappy. Because it'll affect you. And so I, I want you to see this. He fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and he was afterwards hungry. Next verse. And when the tempter came to him, he said, if. Now, I want you to pick up on how many ifs that come up in this context of Scripture. If, he says, if thou be the Son of God, Command these stones to be made bread. Why? Because he was hungry. And so what does the enemy do? He wants to tempt you in an area of weakness. See? He's going to tempt you and say, well, if your God shall supply all of your needs, how come you don't have enough money right now? See? It's always that if, and that's intended to question your identity. Next verse. But Jesus answered. He answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Next verse. Then the devil take them up into a holy city and set them on a, a pinnacle of the temple and saith unto him, if you guys see that again. If thou be the son of God. So what's this questioning his identity? That's what he's going to do to you today. If. The Bible's true. If you're really a child of God, if it's going to always be an if and it has something to do with your identity. If thou be the son of God, cast thyself down for it is written. He shall give his angels charge concerning thee and they shall bear thee up in their hands. Lest thou dash thy foot against the stone. So the devil's quoting Psalm 91 on Jesus. So next verse, Jesus said unto him, it is written again, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Now, Jesus is filled with the word, but I want you guys to pick up on something. It is heart level belief. Because if it's heart level belief, circumstances, come on, won't change. Cir circumstances won't change your belief, right? Heart level belief. We also know, we don't have to turn there, but we know in Daniel chapter 3, when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were challenged and they said, man, if you don't bow, we are going to throw you into the fire. And they said, we just want you to know. We're not bowing. And if you throw us in there, our God is able to deliver us. And even if he don't. We're not bowing. Why? Because that's heart level belief. Amen. See, when you have heart level belief, it doesn't matter what anybody comes to you and says. It won't move you. But if it's not heart level, boy, you'd be surprised, man. There's been so many people that had something happen in their lives. And instead of going closer to God, they walked away. Or they had a bad relationship or something went wrong. And next thing you know, they're no longer with God. It wasn't heart level. It was conditional. Amen. Amen. Jesus said unto him, it is written, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Next verse. Again, the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain and shows him all the kingdoms of the world and, and uh, the glory of them. 
And next verse. And he says unto him, all these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship him. Now, first, he's questioning his identity. He's trying to get Jesus to question if you're the son of God, if, if, if. And now he's given him another if. But this is like, now, if you bow to me. Now, why would he ever bow why would anyone ever bow to the devil? The only way they would bow to the devil is because they don't know who they are in Christ. No person that knows who they are in Christ would ever bow to the devil. So the only way the devil can get you to bow to him is he's got to confuse you in terms of who you are. Because if you know you're a child of God, there is no way you will bow to the devil. So that's why he tempts him in the area of identity first and then now he wants to give him something well if you do this now and then he says uh, but he wants him to fall down and worship him then Jesus says unto him get thee hence Satan for it is written thou shalt worship the Lord thy God and him only shalt thou serve and what happened the devil fleed he left him Behold, the angels came and ministered unto Jesus. But what we see in, in this scripture, we see all these ifs and we see the devil attempting to get Jesus to question his identity. He's getting him to, oh man. And he will do that to you. Oh, man, am I? Am I really saved? Come on. You, see, you know God's forgiven you, then... Why does the devil bring things to your remembrance? Come on. You know God has forgiven you, but then why does the devil try to bring things to your remembrance? And if you're not careful, you'll start to feel uh, some condemnation coming upon you from things that you've done in your past. But the truth is the blood of Jesus has covered, Amen. come on, Amen. that multitude of sin. And the truth is, is Jesus says your sin, sins and inequities, I'll remember them no more. But why would the devil try to bring those things up to you is so that you would start to question your identity. Because if you don't know who you are, you don't know what you can do. You don't know where you can go. But if you know who you are, then now your expectations are going to change. And so Jesus dealt with this situation and he was tired. He was hungry. You know, he had a lot of. You know, because sometimes we have a lot of uh, what we would call reasons. They're really excuses. But we call them reasons. Well, you know, I have a reason for being upset today. Because I didn't get no sleep. Well, let me ask you, have you been fasting for 40 days? Oh, you haven't? Oh, you haven't? See, some people, they are late getting to lunch. Because they got too busy and they didn't get and they are upset because they got delayed in that lunchtime. But Jesus had been fasting 40 days. And so he had the full experience of those negative emotions. Amen. But he defeated the enemy because his belief was on a heart level. If your belief is on a heart level you will always prevail against the devil. Amen. But it has to be on a heart level. If it's not on a heart level, if it's, oh yeah, well, I'm believing now because everything's going good. What happens when things aren't going good? Right. See, if you're wavering, mm -hmm. well, James says the double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. Let not that man think he's getting anything from God. Mm -hmm. So the way God is, is he's like, you're going to believe me or not. Don't believe me today and doubt me tomorrow. But unfortunately, that's the condition of our church. The reason that is that way is because there's not enough word being taught. There's a lot of other things, but not enough Bible because, listen, as much as this will help you, you can uh, have great worship, great atmospheres, great all those things. And those can help you and prepare you. But the Bible doesn't say faith comes by 
the atmosphere. Faith comes by the songs you sing. It says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So the only way for your faith to increase is you're going to have to hear the word. You're going to have to hear the word be preached and you're going to have to commit to it and let it bring transformation into your life. But if we believe on a heart level, we'll start to see greater manifestation. Go to John now. John 11, 38. We'll go 38 to 40. John 11, 38 to 40. Jesus, this is, you know, Lazarus had died. You guys know the story. Just paraphrasing some of this. Jesus, therefore, again, groaning in himself, comes to the grave. It was a cave and a stone lay upon it. So now they're, you know, he's on his way, but he was delayed. And they're like, if you had to come already and all the, you know, the story. But now he's going to the grave. It was a cave and a stone lay upon it. Next verse. And Jesus said, take away the stone. See that? Now remember, his belief was on a heart level. So circumstances. Think about this. Don't tell on yourself, but you've had something happen or, or something was supposed to happen or maybe you was short on some money or just something just didn't go right. And man, you start imagining all this. Become, uh, yeah. Don't tell on yourself. You start imagining all this bad stuff, like everything going wrong. And you just came up with this picture. And a lot of times the stuff you thought was going to happen didn't even happen. But for some reason. Come on. You start going there. You get a call from some, you know, you think something's wrong. Well, Jesus, because he believed on a heart level, he was not affected by circumstances. How many know that's some pretty extreme circumstances? Huh? This is not like I'm a little short on money or one of my loved ones has got, you know, this is no. He's been dead for four days. I mean, oh, if anybody got a reason to doubt, he'd been dead for four days is kind of a good reason. I'm just saying. But what did Jesus do? He acted like he wasn't dead because he had belief on a heart level. And so Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of him that was dead, said unto him, Lord, here goes the explanation. Lord, by this time, he stinks. For he hath been dead for four days. As if Jesus didn't know. Let me just tell you, he's stinking and he'd been up in there for four days. But what does that have to do with the kingdom? Come on, y'all. Well, see, I'm trying to get you to understand this. What does that have to do with the kingdom. What's it have to do with the kingdom if maybe the doctor says you got this and this is the way this is going to work out. But what's that got to do with the kingdom? Because things have been changed. Medical reports have been changed. Uh, there have been people, man, that's been laid on stuff and all of a sudden God got in there and moved stuff around and oh man I'm... and God and got in there canceling debt and doing all kind of stuff. Huh? You can go from being behind on your mortgage to having equity in your house. Ah, oh, yeah. But it's going to be what you do in the midst of it. Amen. It's going to be what you decide. Now, is what you believe on a heart level? Because if what you believe is on a heart level, then you'll start speaking big things. And you'll start saying, well, I don't care what it looks like, but I know God has got this. Amen. 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 I know. I'm telling you, I've told you guys this so many times. The house I'm living in today. Great experience, man. Over three hundred some thousand dollars of, of uh, debt canceled. And then. We got to keep the equity. How's that work? Like, wait a minute. So they gave us a principal reduction, reduced what we owed, but then we kept the equity. That's, that's free money. Amen? Be all before, you know, then you get 
great interest rate that's not even available anymore, that type of stuff. Mm -hmm. But you're like, now, during, during those times, you know, we were, we were going through some tough times, but we believed God. We said, no, we're going to stay faithful to God, man. And guess what? Even in the tightest times, you know, we were still doing tithing. And we were speaking. There, was a, there came a time and said, well, we keep in our house. And back then, everybody was losing their house. But we said, we keep in our house. And man, people, them people are starting to drive by the house, taking pictures of my house. I'm trying to work and concentrate. And they, you know, putting stuff on my door. But we said, no, we keep in our house. Mm -hmm. Amen. Well, if it's heart level belief, you won't be moved. Come on, man. I'm not just telling you guys stuff that I'm just like, oh, I'm just reading. Here's a this is like my own situation. It's been a lot of years by now, but still. So God can turn it around. You had no clue there. I can remember. I may as well just express this even greater for you guys. I was getting harassed, man. I was trying to go to work. There's people calling me because back then, you know, you had a, sometimes these loans, they had, you had a first and a second and all this, whatever. But this man kept calling, bugging me. I'm trying to work. And he was like, pay it. You better pay it. <laughs> I was like scared to answer the phone, man. I'm like, oh, no. But all of a sudden, because we decided we didn't know how, but we confess we keep in our house. And it just changed. And, and God could change stuff. We got something in the mail that said, hey, this is what we're going to do. All you got to do is get down here and sign these papers. I mean, no, I was down there pretty fast to sign, to sign those papers. But the point is, it does not matter what things look like. If your belief is heart level belief, you will not be moved. You will be bold. You don't have to know how God is going to do it. You just have to know he is going to do it. And as long as you have settled that and established that within yourself, you won't be moved. And you will see things change. And this is what Jesus is trying to let Martha know. Martha says he's been dead for four days and all this stuff. But Jesus said unto her, said I not unto thee, that if thou wouldest believe, see that? If you would, I told you this, Martha, if you would believe, you would see the glory of God. Amen. What does that mean? You're going to see something come in and take over that is not hindered by anything in this world. You would see the glory of God. You would see the acts and manifestation of God right here in your own life. Amen? Amen? But what was the key? She had to believe. Well, too many people have circumstances and they got reasons that cause them to go into this doubt. But I'm saying that if we believe, we would see the glory of God. Amen. Go to Mark 9, 23 now. King James. Jesus said unto him. Now, I'm, I'm paraphrasing some of this. You remember how um, the man, had, had, uh, his son was possessed, you know, with the devil, and the devil was tormenting him, and he tried to get Jesus' disciples to go out there and cast out the devil, and they couldn't. Y'all remember this story? Well, now this man is in a, a, a tough situation, and he asked Jesus, if you could do anything, you know, can you help me? Well, Jesus said unto him, if thou canst believe. So it's never a question of his ability. Anything you face in this life, it's never going to be whether God can do it. Uh, well, I wonder if God can do that. It's never going to be that. The question is always going to be, can you believe it? That's it. That's why you have different manifestations in, in people's lives. You have some people experiencing great things and some people are not. 
Some people are getting healed and some people are not. Is that God choosing and just picking and choosing? No, because he says in Acts 10, 34, he is no respecter of persons. But what it has to do with is the belief. And Jesus said unto him, if thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believes. Next verse, I didn't give you guys this, but 24, I believe it says, the man cried out for help for his unbelief. So verse 24, he, he says, um, and straightway the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. But then he says, help thou my unbelief. So I believe, like a lot of Christians, they believe. They believe they're going to heaven. But they don't believe God is a healer. Come on. They believe they're going to heaven. But they don't believe that God is a provider. Yeah, you see what I'm saying? They, they believe they're going to heaven. They don't believe that God can fix their marriage or, you know, things like that. And so what do you do? You cry out to God, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. Because I want to believe in all areas. Amen. Don't limit God, man. I mean, I'm just, I haven't seen God do some, I mean, you know, God, I haven't seen God save the unsavable. People that are not even supposed to be saved get saved. And that's his doing. But what do we do? Believe. And if you believe, if it's heart level belief, you won't waver. And so he cried out, I believe, now help my unbelief. Now go to another one, Matthew 9. Matthew 9, 27 through, yeah, through 31. We'll look in the message translation. So now, and, and this is always good. I, I, I like to remind you guys as much as possible, but man, read the Gospels. It's always going to bring encouragement to you. I know you say, oh, Pastor, I've already read them. That's fine. Read them again. It's just so much stuff in there. You get to picking up on how Jesus was acting and walking the earth, and you'll pick up on how he dealt with so much adversity and how there was so many naysayers and all this type of stuff. And so in, in this story, we know that he's going to the house to heal the girl, right? The girl, but then they, they say she already died, so don't waste your time. But then Jesus says, you know, she's not dead, she's asleep, you know. So this is the scenario. But what they would do back in the day is they'd have these professional whalers. And you know what that is? Somebody getting paid. That's like somebody getting paid to come to a funeral mm -hmm. and cry and ah, put a man. And they're not, they didn't even know the deceased. But they got paid. And so back then they would have these professional whalers who would come in to bring sorrow. And they would be crying. They didn't even know the child. And they're coming in. And Jesus is speaking kingdom. She's not dead. She's asleep. What do they do? They start laughing at him. That's what people have, who have no faith do. They will mock you because you have faith. They will mock you because you say bold things. They'll mock you because you say stuff like, you know, I'm not catching that disease. Come on, they'll, they'll mock you. Because you say things that the world wants you, you know, doesn't want you to say. Amen? They'll mock you. And so now, Jesus kicks out the people, right? He kicks out the naysayers. And he, he speaks to the girl and, and causes her to come back to life. So now this is, you know, wow, this miracle has come forth. But now as Jesus left the house, verse 27, he was followed by two blind men. Now think about that. Just look at what the word is saying. Look at what your, first, your faith could do. So he was followed by two blind men. How they, how they see which way he went? <laughs> <laughs> you ever thought about that? Jesus left the house and he's followed by two blind men. How they, how they know which way he went? Man, they had some faith that was leading them. 
And Jesus left the house and he was followed by two blind men crying out, mercy, son of David, mercy on us. When Jesus got home, the blind men went. So they followed him all the way. They went, the blind men went with him uh, and Jesus said to them, do you really believe I can do this? So this, this is not just a one time cry out. Let me just help you all get the picture. So they're following him as he's going somewhere. Well, it took some time for him to get to where he was going. Well, they didn't just cry out once. They just kept bugging him all the way, tracking him. And they're following him all the way. And then he finally says, do you really believe I can do this? They said, why, yes, master. And then look at it. He touched their eyes and said, look, what that, what's that 29 say? This is the message translation. What does he say? So he touched their eyes and he didn't say, I cast out that blindness and I this and that. He said, become what you believe. Because they had to have faith to follow him. They had to have some way to be dedicated and committed to follow him. And you can imagine the streets were not empty. So in those times, the cities were condensed and everything is crowded. Yet these guys are tracking him and they can't even see. And so they had some real heart level belief. And so he touched their eyes and he said, become what you believe. Become what you believe. And so if we're looking at this, we say, well, we have the power to become whatever we believe. Well, how do we know it's true? We have a scripture even to back it up. Jesus said, become what you believe. Now, this is why, once again, the enemy is after your belief. And that's why I'm preaching this message and telling you to take your power back. Your power is your ability to believe. Your ability to believe God in the midst of naysayers. Your ability to believe God in the midst of insurmountable odds against you. But you have an ability. You have a supernatural force on the inside of you that will give you some tenacity. Come on, somebody. That will give you some strength. That will give you some endurance. And you'll refuse to back down. I've decided I'm never going to change what I believe. I don't care what they're doing in the world. I still believe Psalm 91 prevails for me. I, it doesn't matter if they're dropping bombs on Temecula. I believe Psalm 91 is protecting my house. Come on, somebody. It, it doesn't matter if they said, oh, well, they have now released poisonous gases. Come on, somebody. I believe that I have a supernatural mask on my face that keeps whatever's out there from getting me. Oh, well, I, you know, I don't know. Well, you don't know, so you better get you some other kind of mask. But I know, and I ain't worried about it. And I've seen this happen. I've seen, I've been around, I've been in other countries, been around people that, you know, I know I got, I did get challenged when I was in India and I had to go pray for that man and he had this green thing on his leg and I was, a little, I have to admit, I was like, Lord, <laughs> you want me to lay hands on that? <laughs> I ain't going to lie. I was a little, you know, I, I don't mind telling on myself. I did lay hands, but I did kind of cut my hand to where <laughs> my fingers went around it and I didn't, I didn't necessarily touch that thing. But honestly, Whatever that green thing was can't get on me because I'm on assignment. And I've also been in situations where I've prayed over people that are sick. I've been in the hospitals and, you know, everybody's got masks on. Everybody's so nervous. I've been all over the place and it don't affect me. Why? Because of what I believe. I don't believe that I'm going to catch something from somebody. So that's why I don't. But that's a belief thing. Now, that's a choice that I get to make. 
I probably gained the most haters in all of my years of preaching when COVID hit. Before that, I was just probably not liked by a lot. But when COVID hit, I became more so an enemy. <laughs> it's like, dang. Because I was refusing to bow to it. I was refusing to give in. And I was refusing to encourage anyone else to give in. I was standing against it. Amen? And for the whole first year, COVID hit. We didn't have no, nobody at this church got it. For the first year, the faith was high. I think sometimes faith is higher when people are, like, they have a choice. They, well, their choice is, I better have faith or I could die. Then a lot of people have faith. But then when the enemy waters it down, because remember when COVID first came out? I remember hearing about, like, a basketball player that got it. And I, the information that we had back then, I thought, oh, man. This man's career is over. He's just, you know, because it was like a death sentence. But then after time went on, people realized not everybody's dying and stuff like that. Then now a lot of people put their guards down. Then a lot of people before when they had that fear of death, they had an itch in their throat. They were buying. I bind you in Jesus name. It ain't no COVID. You're not getting on me. And they was fighting for their life. But then after they got comfortable and they realized, oh, not everybody's dying. And then they said, oh, I got this thing. I better go down and get that check. See? Well, don't ever get comfortable. It's always life and death. It's always a challenge. So don't ever get comfortable with it. Keep believing. And so that scripture said you become what you believe. Go to Luke 145. Luke 145. Man, we might finish early and the kids are watching a movie. <laughs> like, man. Uh, but now we know what Jesus told Mary, right? He sent the angel. Now, the angel told Mary, you're going to be pregnant. But not only are you going to be pregnant, you're going to be pregnant with the Son of God. And Mary said, well, be it unto me. Well, that's a lot different than Zechariah, right? Because Zechariah, the angel tried to tell Zechariah, hey, your wife Elizabeth, she gonna, she's barren, but she's going to have a, a son. And Zechariah got to question it and got his tongue just, you know, the angel just said, okay, you're not talking anymore until the baby's born. Because he doubted. Well, Mary, she disbelieved. She said, well, be it unto me. Well, because of that belief, she was blessed. And verse 45 says, And blessed is she that believes, for there shall be a performance of those things which were told unto her. So because she believed, there's going to be a performance. Now, we know that God had to come to the earth. But how many know he could use somebody else? So even if he wants to use you for something, if you don't believe he won't use you, but it doesn't mean he's not going to do what he intended to do. It just means he's going to use someone else. So let us be those people that say, use me, Lord, because I believe and I don't need any explanation because, you know, he could use you for something great that's beyond you. That's above your education level. It's above your abilities. But all you need to do is be able to believe. And that's that power that's within you. Because if you don't have that power, amen, if you don't have that power to believe, you won't be able to prevail. You won't be able to succeed. Now go to Mark. We're going to close in a minute, but Mark chapter 6, this is a difference. So Jesus is doing all these great things, but now it comes time for him to go to his hometown. And sometimes, and Jesus even says, a prophet is without honor in his own place. So basically he has honor everywhere else except here. Well, and that's the problem in a lot of families because, or even friends, they might still see you as who you used to be. So they have trouble receiving from you. Amen. But Jesus was not able. So he's in Nazareth, his own place, his hometown, 
But it says in verse 5, and he was not able to do even one work of power there. Now stop right there. Why was he not able to do one work of power? It says, except, you know, heal a few people. So minor ailments, you know, little colds and little stuff like that. But it says he was not able to do even one work of power there, except he laid his hands on a few sickly people and cured them. But why was he not able to do one work of power? You guys know why? There was no belief. So it wasn't that his power, he had the same power as the same Jesus that had been walking around with all this power. It's not like God said, I'm lifting the power off of you because you're going into Nazareth. The power was still there, but it was the belief in the people that was not there. And so what happened? That lack of belief, that unbelief in the people like he told Martha, didn't I tell you, if you believe, you will see the glory of God. Well, basically, if you don't believe, you're not going to see it. Amen. And so next verse. And he marveled because of their unbelief, their lack of faith in him. And I believe he's marveling that still today because of the unbelief in people. Because people don't believe God. They say they do, but then when it comes down to it, they really don't. And he marvels. Think about it. If you really believe that God's your protector, what are you going to be afraid of? I mean, what? And so he marveled because of their unbelief, their lack of faith in him. And he went about among the surrounding villages. See, and he continued teaching, continued doing his work, but he couldn't do it there because of their unbelief. And so belief is the power. That's the power you have. But that's the power you got to take back. That's the power you got to say, oh, no, I'm going to believe God. I don't have all the understanding and all that type of stuff, but I'm going to believe God. And I'm going to experience a greater life because of my decision to believe God. Now, people that can only believe God for heaven. That might not be real belief. And we're not the ones that would be able to know whether they really believe it or not, because we're not there when it's their time to leave this earth. Because nobody, you can't see that on anybody. You can't see like, you know, if they really believed in heaven, they really, we like to say, well, they gave their life to the Lord, so I believe they went to heaven, but we don't know for sure. And so really what you want to do is you want to be able to illustrate your belief while you're here on earth. Don't stop at believing God for heaven. Believe him for everything. Amen. Believe him every day of your life. Believe him for every situation that you encounter. Understand the word is true. He's never going to leave you or forsake you. And understand the word is true, that there is nothing that's too hard for your God. So be a person that takes that power back and you let the enemy know, you try to take my power, the one true power I have, you try to take it away from me, but I'm taking it back. And I'm gonna believe God according to his word. Amen. And I'm going to get results according to his word. Amen. Amen. Go ahead and give the Lord a hand clap tonight. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Let, let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus that you met us here tonight, that you gave us a chance to hear your word. Lord, I believe by faith that the words that were spoken here tonight are bringing forth the harvest. I believe that lives are being tr transformed because of your truth. And we've made this conscious decision that we're going to just be a people that keep on believing. Heart level belief. Doesn't matter what the circumstances may be. We're going to believe you. We thank you. Maybe you're watching this and uh, maybe you don't know Jesus as Lord. 
We want you to know right now that you can come into the kingdom. And Jesus has his arms open. He says, if anyone knocks, uh, uh, he says, I knock on their, the door of their hearts. But if anyone opens, I'm going to come in and dine with them. And so all you got to do is open up. Anyone who hears this message, repeat this and God will come into your life. Church, let's repeat this prayer. Let's say it together. Jesus, please forgive me for all of my sins. I commit my life into your hands. This day, I am saved. Do with me as you please. And fill me with the power of the Holy Ghost. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Go ahead and clap for the Lord. Amen. Praise God.